The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. If you look at the syllabus, uh, I have my office hour, Monday, 5 to 6. And I would like to, I know many of you, but also I, many of you I do not know. Uh, if we have not met before, uh, I would like to ask you to come to my office hour and let's uh, chat a little bit and see what's your interest. Uh, that way I can better uh, prepare myself. I also uh, read through your uh, feedback in the first class. Uh, as I expected, uh, the interest varies broadly, and also uh, the background varies broadly. Uh, uh, that's uh, always the nature uh, I encountered in the past, and we don't have a, a good solution for that. So I uh, ask uh, if you have learned this stuff, be patient. Uh, if you haven't, uh, we'll come over there, uh, get, get there. And uh, many of you also are very much interested in liquid. So I want to uh, tell you that liquid is very difficult. Okay? And uh, uh, when I uh, wrote the book, I put everything on a parallel path. I can deal with um, solid, crystal solid, crystalline solid, and gas, photons, electrons. But when it came to liquid, uh, it became a lot more complicated. So if you look at the book, there was a specific chapter on liquid. And that you have to be more patient and wait uh, until almost the end uh, of this uh, uh, class. Uh, OK. With that, uh, uh, remember, I would like to see you. Uh, if we haven't talked before, come to my office hour. And uh, let's know each other better. Uh, if you uh, think about what we talked in the last lecture, last time, we reviewed the classical laws this, uh, for heat, for momentum, right? uh, heat conduction, heat conversion, thermal radiation. Um, in terms of momentum, for example, uh, they live in shear stress law. And uh, we uh, also Ohm's law, mass diffusion, fixed law. So those are the constitute relations for the transport processes. So we did classical laws. And uh, uh, I did also, we went into more microscopic picture behind these classical laws. And we say at the end, uh, in terms of carriers for energy, momentum, charge, uh, uh, say uh, we only have uh, essentially four types, major types, molecules, uh, electrons, photons, and that is vibration. I brought up the name phonons. Right, so we went to uh, some microscopic description for those transport processes. And uh, uh, what I simplify all this problem is a gas picture. I have molecular gas in a box. I have electron gas in a box and the phonon gas in a box. So uh, that's why we can do a parallel treatment for all those energy carriers. And uh, what I'm going to do in today's lecture is trying to give a first crack on the questions that we're going to answer through the whole semester. And uh, uh, those questions, what are the questions you want to ask? I want to ask now, if I look at this microscopic picture, I want to take first one individual carrier and ask, 
what's its energy. I can also ask uh, what's the momentum, charge, but let me just uh, pick the energy first. And then I'm going to look at a cluster, a box of those uh, uh, carriers, molecules, at certain temperature, I ask uh, how many of those uh, carriers have certain energy and uh, how far, how fast they travel. So first question is how much? Okay, here you can see how much energy, but there's one carrier. Right? And then I'm going to ask how many of them and uh, how fast they travel and uh, how far they travel. And how they interact. Okay, and with that, we can start. I give you a simple derivation of the diffusion laws. Uh, last time we showed Ohm's law, for example. Uh, this time I will show you uh, the uh, Fourier heat conduction law. And with that, you can go back and do other laws, the fixed law and Newton shear stress law. This can all be similarly uh, done. So. Uh, let's look at per energy of uh, per carrier, right? So we can say how much. Look at the one carrier. So I have a box of uh, gas molecules. Let's say I have hydrogen, and this is a diatomic. molecule, right? So we have two hydrogen atoms, and we have one hydrogen, another hydrogen atom, they are bound together. And then when I look at the energy of this molecule, I look at the possible modes, possible ways of storing energy by the molecule. What are the forms of energy? I'm sorry? Kinetic and potential energy. Okay, so we have kinetic energy. That's a translation. So this hydrogen molecule is moving around, right? And in that case, I look at the mass center. I can say, okay, I don't care about these two individual atoms. They are, they are just a cluster, and they move at a certain velocity. And the kinetic energy, E, equals one half mv squared, right? So last time I made a statement, if you understand energy, momentum, and entropy. And now we're looking, go into the molecular picture and look at those energies. So this is a translation, kinetic energy. What other energies? Rotation, vibration, OK? And uh, let's, let's look at the vibration. So these two molecules are bound by spring. We, in fact, talked about uh, the, uh, uh, the interatomic uh, force in the last lecture, right? The minimum point is the equilibrium. So we can approximate it as a, a spring. And this is a relative vibration within these two atoms. That's another way to store the energy, right? So the vibration and in fact, you can simplify this because this now is the two atom motion. But if you simplify it relative to the center of the mass, and you can essentially do an effective mass spring problem. 
So this is a classical mass spring problem. And then you know for this classical spring mass, what's the energy? Energy, let's say you have the displacement is x. Half k x squared. OK. Half k x squared, that's the potential. There's another part, right? One translation also, mv squared. This is the way not the center of mass moving, it's a relative vibration. So the mass is relative to the center. What's the potential? This is the potential energy, kx squared, right? Uh, yeah, I'm not considering gravity. You can add gravitation. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's possible. OK, so we have uh, vibration. And uh, you also mentioned rotation. So we have also rotation. And rotation is now, I can take a simple picture. I fix this spring. Right? And now I have a rod with two balls attached to it, and they will rotate. And the energy, our rotational energy, is a one half i omega squared. Right? i is the moment of inertia, and omega squared is, omega is the angular momentum the angular velocity, right? So we have translation, vibration, rotation. Anything else? Anything else? Don't forget the charge, right? So if I look at individual hydrogen atom, and it has Nuclei and has electrons more around. Okay, so we also have electronic and the electronic uh, energy. I can rather either use E symbol or potential. The interaction of two charge. Let's say here is a Q1, here is a Q2. Then the Coulomb potential, right? The Coulomb interaction, two charges. Anyone remember that? Q1, Q2, 4 pi epsilon r. Epsilon is dielectric constant, right? r is the separation between the two. Okay. So those are the form of energy this molecule stores with it. So when we think about internal energy of a gas, they are stored in those forms, translation, vibration, rotation, electronic. OK? And so that's uh, the case of uh, a molecule. And if we go to solid, which is a, a lot more complex, we'll talk more li later. But see, last time we gave a simple picture of collected the atom by spring, so it has a vibration, right? And also, each atom has electrons, a nuclei, so it has the electronic. And uh, in fact, uh, for solid, it doesn't have this rotation, right? The atoms don't rotate. It's fixed there. So that's, uh, in that sense, that's better, right? When I deal with the liquid, I have more trouble because of all these other possibilities. OK. So uh, let's leave this to later. and. Uh, what I want to say is those are all the classical form 
classical expressions, right? And what we're going to move on next is to give the quantized form. In quantum mechanics, right, what are the micro, the energy of the translation, vibration, rotation, and electronic. And there we'll see the quantization of energy levels. And that's very important. Okay. <clears throat> now this is a, a individual um, energy, how much. What we look next is how many of them. Okay, and I have a box of molecule here, and of course I can say, well, per unit volume, this is the number of molecules per unit volume. Right, that's the number of molecules per unit volume. But each molecule could have one half of mv squared. That v in my current picture is not defined velocity, right? It could be anywhere from negative infinite velocity is a vector, negative infinite to positive infinite. So the question is, if I give you a box of gas at certain temperature t, now I'm bringing the thermal part. How much energy, what's the probability of the molecule having a certain value of energy, E? Right? Because the number of molecules is very large, I have to bring in the statistical picture. OK? So at temperature T, Temperature T, is a, let's look at the translation only. So I can simplify my picture even uh, um, more simplified. I don't consider a hydrogen atom. I consider a helium atom, right? Monatomic gas, translation energy only. Of course, there is the electronic part. So at temperature T, how much is, uh, say, what's the probability of a molecule has actually certain value of energy? Right? What's the answer? Uh, yeah, so that's the, this is going to the statistical uh, Thermal physics, statistical physics, and uh, the distribution is given by the famous Boltzmann factor. I try to use all capitals now. So Boltzmann factor tells you the probability of finding a, a molecule or atom has a certain energy E at temperature T is a normalization. This is a probability, right? So it has a normalization constant minus E over Kb T. And this Kb is the Boltzmann constant we mentioned last time. Kb is 1.38 10 to the minus 23 jar per Kelvin. Right. So that's the Boltzmann factor. And uh, some of you taking statistical physics, and that's easy. If you haven't taken it, you learned a real law. Any time people look at the temperature dependent, they always like to put the exponential factor. That's because the Boltzmann is behind it. Okay? 
and then we'll come back to this later on. So I'm going to build on this exponential factor and to determine what's the average energy per molecule, translation energy per molecule, and how I do it. First, I need to find this normalization factor, A, and I determine this probability. So let's examine the translational energy, M, V squared. So V is really high, this vector, right? It's so Vx, V by Vz, so I'll write Vx squared plus Vy squared plus Vz squared. OK? And now I take advantage of the definition for this F probability is I find the molecule having velocity from minus infinite to plus infinite must normalize to 1, right? That's all the range you can have. So from the normalization, from minus infinite to plus infinite for Vx, Vy, Vz, right? I'm doing it. First, I'll do it in Cartesian coordinate. Then I'll transfer to a spherical coordinate. So let's look at the first Cartesian coordinate from minus infinite to plus infinite dvx minus infinite to plus infinite dvy. And one warning is that you will often encounter many of those integral forms. Because we, when we look at the probability, we have to integrate uh, from all the possible states. So Vx, Vy, Vz, and uh, F. So I put a Boltzmann factor. So this is an integrand. Is, uh, uh, I'm going to be lazy. I'm not writing that exponential, Et. So you put it in there. This should equal to 1, right? You look at it, if you plug in your E in Vx squared, Vy squared, Vz squared, and you can factor it out, and you can do your integration for dVx individually, dVy individually, dVz individually. And with that, you only have a constant A you do not know, and you determine that constant A, right? So I'm not going through the integral. And you can either check the integration table, or there is a nice mathematic trick. If you like it to play, you can find that integration value. So here, what I have is 2 pi kb t 3 halves. 3 halves is because each of this contributes 1 half. OK? So now I have, if I plug in this A into the F, I get F in terms of Vx, Vy, Vz. The distribution at temperature T is M 2 pi kb T 3 halves exponential. I want to write the whole thing. So this is a Vx squared plus a Vy squared plus a Vz squared divided by 2 kBt. And this is the Maxwell distribution. Maxwell velocity distribution. Distribution. OK? So it looks uh, 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 pretty uh, tedious, but essentially it's one half, it's, it's an energy expression, one half mv squared. Maxwell. What have you heard about Maxwell? What other things you heard about Maxwell? <laughs> Maxwell equations, right? You probably heard that rather than this. Let's say, uh, in fact, uh, you look at all those uh, 
very famous people in the ASA 1800s, 1900s, they've done many things, right? Newton, not just the Newton mechanics law, Newton optics also. You can do all this. OK, here is velocity. I'm using Vx, Vy, Vz, right? I could make my life much easier if I use, very often when I do this integration, I change the coordinate. Rather than dvx, dvy, dvz, I do a spherical coordinate because it's symmetric. OK? So if I change my coordinate to from a dvx, dvy, dvz into a spherical co coordinate, due to symmetry, is 4 pi v squared dv. Right? V now is the r, the radius. And so the range of v is from 0 to positive infinite. It's not from negative infinite to infinite, right? When you do, if you think about from dx, dy, dz into r coordinate. OK. So because of that, and then my, my normalization, when I do normalization, if I use spherical coordinate, it's 0 to infinite. And uh, f way, now I do not use vx, vy, vz. I use f way and d way equals 1. That's another way to do it, OK? And in this case, your f way equals 4 pi v square m 2 pi kvt 3 half exponential minus m v square over 2 kvt. It's simple rewriting the Cartesian into a spherical. But the point I want to make is uh, if you use a way, you, uh, uh, you, you do not do, uh, see, because the 4 pi v squared is already included here. So you can substitute this back into here and just do your vx, vy, vz again. Let's be consistent on which coordinate system you will be using. OK, so what does this tell me? This math, right? I'm jumping into a little bit of math. Because f is a probability, right? So now with that probability, I can calculate the average. I can calculate what's the average energy per molecule, what's the average, uh, um, any other numbers that you will be interested in. So, if I calculate the average E per molecule, the translation, right? So my average will be, now depending on which system I, I, you choose, you can do Cartesian or you can do the spherical. Now I'm going to write simply as a spherical, so zero to infinite, and the energy is one half mv square, that's the average quantity. The quantity I want to find, what's the average given my f distribution, right? So I times fv, I integrate over v. Now you can do your math to find that integral. OK, that's why I'm warning you, you don't want to, if you use v, you want to be consistently all v. You don't do vx, vy, vz. If you do vx, vy, vz, you start from here. You do your Cartesian at the beginning. That f is different from what I write here. It's the same thing, but uh, just be consistent. See? So again, I say you can go do that homework. And what you have here is a one third kbt. All that math give you a very beautiful, very simple result. So kbt is a quantity you will see often if you go to microscopic world. That's the thermal energy, average thermal energy, translational energy of the molecule. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, if you divide uh, by this, that's one, oh, okay. Okay. right? Okay. So that's I already. That's why my normalization factor. Right, we're doing the normalization factor. Okay, so with this, I can go to say what's the average velocity. I say how, right? How much here is how much average energy per particle? Let's see. Based on this, because of this translation. Uh, one half mv square. So, what's the average speed of the molecule? So, we can go to calculate it. Right? Uh, so, I have average one half mv square equals two third kbt. And v square, I take a square root of that, so I can tell the magnitude is, uh, um, here I have 3 kBT over m. OK, what's the order of magnitude? Let's put in numbers. I always like to put in numbers. I take a helium gas. And helium, I can count how many, what's the mass, right? Helium has uh, two neutrons, two protons, two electron masses, two light. The electron masses are two thousandths, one, one over two thousandths of the mass of protons. I forget about the electron mass, right? So it's uh, uh, four times the proton mass. Proton mass, 1.67, 10 to the mass, 31 kilo. Again, I only remember the SI unit. Not 31, I'm sorry. Uh, that's 31 is the electron, 27. OK? So if I plug in this mass, KBT is 1.38, 10 to the minus 23. Temperature is 300 Kelvin. Right, so what I'll get is a vol average velocity uh, speed. This one is 1.36 10 to the third meter per second. It's about thousand meter per second. Yes. Ah, uh, you could go to calculate, right? Uh, you can you you can calculate the. Uh, it's also KBT. It's a V mass uh, V square. Do that. Yeah. You'll get also KBT. That's the variance. OK? So this is a he helium. Now if you put the air, air, air average mass 27, right? So you put in 27, you get about 500 meter per second. Those molecules are moving pretty fast. And the last lecture, we discussed the momentum, the pressure. Right? We're feeling one atmospheric pressure, and that's the momentum from these fast moving molecules. Right? So, uh, one more common, and this uh, three half. KBT, there is a very fundamental theorem behind this. And that is, if the distribution obeys the Boltzmann distribution, and at a high temperature, so by doing that high temperature, I can do the integration. Later on, when we introduce quantum, you can't do the integration anymore. Okay. So at high temperature, the energy is very close, so I can do an integration. And if the energy form for each energy form, if it's a quadratic, so what do I mean? So if you look at the kinetic energy, this is a 1 half mv x squared, right? So each quadratic form, if you go to do the average energy, 
you find that average energy is one half kT. Okay, so one half kT, one half kT, one half kT, KT that's three half kT, and that's called the equipartition theorem. Okay, uh, I gave that's an example of the uh, translational energy. And if you go to vibration, you see here, right? It's a quadratic term, one, one half kx squared, the velocity one half mv squared. So at a very high temperature, this is one half kT, average speaking. This is one half kT. And the rotation, one half i omega square. Again, it's quadratic, right? At a high temperature, that's one half kT. And in fact, the rotation, that high temperature is only 80 Kelvin or so for molecules. The vibration is go to a few thousand degree. OK, so that's why. You learned the idea gas law before, right? CV for different monatomic idea gas, diatomic idea gas, they have different CV values. That's because diatomic gas, you have the rotational modes come in, and monatomic only the translation. That's the equal partition theorem. Well, we'll go to discuss that more later on. But here, with that, we get a feeling how fast and how much energy they have. Right? Next, what we want to answer is how far they travel. OK, so we have. How far they travel. By how far, I mean, think about the air molecules in this room, right? We have huge number. Always, uh, I give numbers uh, 10 to 23rd, one more, right? Huge number of molecules. And they will collide with each other, right? So normally they carry their energy, and then the next time they collide with the other molecules. So I want to give a very quick estimation. What's the distance between those collisions? How far they travel? And uh, so to do that, let's say in this case, I have to think about the molecule no longer a point, right? I have to think about the final size of the molecule. The final size, if you think, what determines the size? It could be the electric field potential. Right? You have a nuclei, and uh, there's an uh, electric field that spill out. And then when the two molecules collide with, with each other, and uh, that's when the field start to interact. Okay? And uh, so I give, a, let's say, a diameter of a molecule as D. Okay, this diameter could be typically a few angstroms, one angstrom, two angstrom. Okay. And uh, now, if I think about this molecule, final size is moving, and the collision happens when there is another molecule within distance of D. Right. So this is a 2D. OK. And the way I can think about it, do a very quick estimation is, let's say I have a molecule, and the uh, over a trajectory, uh, say, uh, uh, a tube of diameter 2D 
it travels certain distance. So this tube is diameter 2D, right? And travels certain distance. Let's say here this distance is L. And then what's the volume? So that tube is the, uh, the area times the distance, right? So the volume is, um, OK, 4 pi uh, 2D squared. Right? This is the area times the length gives me the volume that this molecule, this tube sweeps. Right? Now, how I decide the average distance between one collision, one collision, right? That is when the Lambert density per unit volume, this is the Lambert of molecule per unit volume, times the volume. When that equals 1, that's one collision. Do you agree? So when the average number of, say, the per unit volume, what's the number of molecule, times over this tube of 2D, the length L, when this equals 1, that's one collision this molecule will have with other molecules. And under this one condition, that L is really what I call the mean free pass, the average distance between collision equals, here you can say, is uh, pi d squared over n uh, times n. Right? This is the mean free pass that the molecule travels between collision. OK? And uh, if you do a better job, this one is assuming the other molecule do not move, right? just a stationary distribute there. And if you do all the more detail, it turns out this expression is still pretty good. So the mean free pass mean free pass is a more accurate that is put the square root of two here is pi d square times n. Okay, now with that we can go to guess estimate uh, the uh, mean free pass of the air molecules, or typical gas. So if it's a gas, ideal gas, if it's ideal gas, and we know pressure we derived last time, in fact, is N, this is the KBT. Right? N is the number of particles per unit volume, not the more fraction. Right? So this is the number of particles per unit volume. So I replace this N. And uh, in this case, what I get that the mean free pass is KBT square root of the 2 pi d square pressure. OK? So let's put in number and say what's the mean free pass in a typical condition. Gamma is KBT is uh, uh, KB is 1.38 10 to the minus 23 jar Kelvin times 300 Kelvin and uh, square root of 2 pi d. D, let me take a 2.5 Armstrong. This is by no means mean to be accurate. Meter square. OK? Pressure, one atmosphere. So 110 to the fifth, right? Newton per meter square. And you go to putting all the numbers, so this is minus 23rd, this is minus 20, right? And uh, 
uh, here, so that means the 20, minus, 20, minus 3, and here is the fifth, so minus 8. And uh, uh, this 300, uh, you go to check your numbers, I give you a value I have. Uh, this one I get 0.14. So 0.14 micron, so 10 to the minus 6, 100 nanometer. That's about the average distance the air molecules travel in this room. Okay? And uh, if you recall before, I said a disk drive. And the disk in magnetic disk is a few nanometer now, the separation. And they're still using fluid mechanics to design that slider so that they do not collide with the disk. And you come to a regime where the air molecules do not collide with each other, they'll collide with the boundary more often. Right? So this is the average mean free path. Now, you can see in the case of ideal gas, that pressure is in the denominator. How many of you do vacuum related? Have vacuum experience, right? So vacuum, typical vacuum, let's say 10 to minus 6 tall, right? You can use a, 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 a typical diffusion pump to easily drive to a 10 to minus 6 tall. So what's the molecule mean free pass when it's a 10 to minus 6 tall? Uh, I put it in there, 10 to the minus 6 tor is uh, 10 to the minus 6. Remember, uh, here is uh, 10 to the fifth, but uh, one tor is 760, right? Uh, one atmosphere is 760 tor. So this is uh, the pressure you put in there, and then you get 100 meter. Okay? So in vacuum pump, vacuum system, the molecules do not collide with each other. You use an evaporator. You heat it up. You heat the atom. The atom go out and go straight to your target. So it's completely a ballistic trajectory. You don't do the heat conduction diffusion theory anymore. You, don't, you, you, you have to trace the trajectory. Right. OK. So this is uh, uh, how far. We have some idea. And uh, next, let's briefly discuss how they interact with each other. How do they interact? OK. As I mentioned, uh, when the two molecules right, uh, collide with each other, it's really the electric field extends certain space. And when uh, the two molecules get close, the electric field collide, uh, say, repel each other. So they go different trajectory, right? So you have simple, you can think about the two billar ball collision. And if you want to do the trajectory, and uh, uh, the, uh, you, what you do is uh, during the collision, you have energy conservation, you have momentum conservation, right? So in that case, uh, this is really the microscopic world, the basic. Uh, Conservation laws, the conservation principle you apply. So you have energy and momentum conservation. <coughs> and uh, if the collision is among the air molecules, uh, it's uh, uh, typically it's a limit of the how fast the how far the molecule travels. So it's an internal 
you can think of that as more as the internal stuff, internal loss. But when you think about the, the energy conversion, what does really energy conversion mean? Energy conversion is one type of energy going to the other type, right? So when gas molecule drive a turbine, is this kinetic energy becomes the average motion of the blade. Now, another type is think about the photovoltaic cell. What's that energy conversion? Of course, what you want is that photon eventually come out and get electricity, right? But what you get in the microscopic level is an electron is sitting over here, a photon comes in and lift the electron to here. You have the first step of your energy conversion already, right? Of course, that's not that your photovoltaic cell yet, and the light from the lamp is absorbed by all the stuff around us eventually. That's the energy conversion, except at the end we can't capture it, right? And uh, uh, so you have different losses in the process that you have to take care of if you want to finally extract the things that's useful. OK. So this kind of interaction is dealing with the collision, dealing with the interaction. This is arguably the most complicated step in the transport. OK. Now with that, uh, let's go to what I want to give you is a simple kinetic theory uh, of transport. So I now, there are, see, uh, how, many, how long air molecule will travel, and then what I'm, I know their velocity, what I'm going to do next is to show how we can do a simple derivation for the Fourier law of heat conduction. And as I said, you can do the same derivation using the same strategy for mass diffusion, for momentum diff uh, say, uh, transfer, and uh, 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 in fact, you have homework on this. So I'm considering conduction only no, no average motion, right? I have the uh, gas molecules and any gas. In fact, uh, it applies to electron, applies to phonon, as long as I have this gas picture, right? And I have a, a temperature gradient in the x direction. So this is a heat flow in the x direction. Right? Temperature gradient there. And I want to derive the Fourier law. And then microscopically, if I can count, basically I'm counting. So when I look at the flux, right, across certain cross section, so here I'm going to say this is the cross section I'm looking at. Here is the x. On the left, I have molecules. On the right, I have molecules, right? And the molecules are doing random motion. And on the left, there are slight higher temperature. On the right, slight lower temperature. Now, some of this molecule will go across this imaginary interface I draw without collision. So I count that, those molecules that can go through the interface. So from left to right, months from right to left, that's my left flux. Okay? So I'm doing my energy balance. And uh, so what I count, I say left, I have here within how, how I say, I say what's the range? This is a, the Vx times tau. Tau is the time between collision. Okay? 
That's something I forgot to mention. Tau, because I have a mean free pass, so I have the mean free pass divided by velocity that gives me, or speed that gives me the average time between collision, right? So I say Vx, because this is velocity in the x component, in x direction, Vx times tau. As long as those molecules is in this range, they can go across this imaginary interface here, right? And of course, uh, only half of them have that chance. Half goes this way, half go the other way. I'm doing the random, right? Right, Browning motion. So I have my Q is uh, one half. This is the average number per unit per unit volume. And times the Vx, this is the speed. So if you look at this, this gives me here is a per unit volume, here is a meter per second. So that gives me per meter square per second. That's the flux, right? The flux of the particles per meter square per second. And times each particle carry this energy E. So you can replace that energy by charge. That's a diffusion of charge, right? If you do one, that's a diffusion. Or the, if, you, if you times the mass of a particle, that's the diffusion of mass in terms of the weight, right? So here is x mass of Vx times tau. That's on the left going to right. And the mass from the right going to left. So there are also half of this. This is also Vx over tau. That's the chance going from left to the right. So that's the difference of the two gives me, you see here that I'm, it's Vx plus tau, right? So that's my heat flux. If you check, this is a one over meter square a cubic. Here is a meter per second. Here is jar. So I will get a watt per meter square. OK? And of course, what I'm going to do next, uh, oh, here is a Vx, x components. What I'm going to do next is uh, to write it into differential form. This is uh, very short, right? As long as I'm dealing with the macroscopic, I can write this 100 nanometer range into a differential form. So I do my differential. What I have is a Q equals, because this is a positive, is a minus. So I have minus in the front, 1 half d n v x tau, uh, e, that's what's inside, and dx. And the, the x difference is v x tau minus v x tau. So I have 2 v x tau. Right? So now I'm doing a little skipping. I'm going to put the Vx, pull Vx out. I neglect all those temperature dependence of velocity. And this is actually because you can have copper mass and heat transfer, but I'm skipping, making the sense easier. So what I have here is one half cancel. I have. Uh, Vx square tau and d n times e is u and dx, right? U is energy per unit volume. Okay. So Vx square is one third of V square. I'm doing, right? So what I have here, oh, the negative sign. So I have one third V square tau and du dt. I'm using chain rule dt 
dx. What's this d u dt? That's the heat, yeah, specific heat per unit volume, right? So this one is, say, is the specific heat is jar meter cubic Kelvin. Typically, we do specific per unit density, per unit mass, but uh, it's fine. So what I have here is a K Fourier law dt dx. And I also obtain uh, expression for K is a one third say V tau square, right? Uh, no, C V square tau. C V square tau, and which is a one third C gamma uh, V, C V gamma. So this is the Fourier law, and also the expression for the thermal conductivity, right? OK? And if you look at thermal conductivity, it's proportional to the mean free pass, proportional velocity, proportional specific heat. If you check for gas, what's high, which gas has the highest thermal conductivity? Helium. So the velocity is higher. OK? And so we have, with that, I have the uh, uh, simple derivation. And later on, we're going to give you more complicated derivation based on Boltzmann equation. But this is a hand waving one, and it's pretty good. At the end, if you use Boltzmann, you'll still get k equals 1 third CV gamma. OK? Any questions here? Or doubt. If not, let's make a few comments. So those, of course, are what you learned the classical diffusion theory, right? And you can see immediately, if I do uh, take the example of the uh, disk drive, my space is much smaller than this mean free pass. I cannot do the derivative anymore. All right? So I have to go to look at more complicated. So this is where the nano start to deviate. So what, what we're looking when we look into the, what's the fundamental difference, right? So I have, and uh, uh, what's the really the micro nano fundamental difference? And there are several regimes. One is I always have a device characteristic lens. For example, in the slider, the, the disk drive is the separation between slider and disk, right? So I have one is a characteristic length, the mean free pass. If the mean free pass becomes larger or comparable to a separation, let's say D, a characteristic length of the transport problem, right? And in that case, the diffusion theory will no longer be valid, and the air molecule will collide with the boundary. And uh, as long as the quantum effects are not important, then you run into a classical size effect regime. So classical size effect. So this is the one case, right? But you can ask, uh, how do you know your quantum size effect is not important, right? So let's take a look. Now we're going to move a little bit into quantum. And uh, 
So the next case is a quantum size effect. And in fact, sometimes I don't like to call it the quantum size effect. I like to call it a wave effect. Right? And this is the case when you have to think about the wavelengths as another characteristic dense, dense scale. And uh, uh, I, would, I prefer to call this wave effects. Not, I'm sure that people don't always agree with me. But say, uh, here, let's take a look, plus with the quantum, with the uh, wave, uh, what, uh, uh, take a basic picture here. Uh, we know we're going to get into more in the next lecture. That, uh, say, anything from quantum uh, per picture is both the wave and the particle. Right? So wave has a wavelength. And uh, so we have a wavelength. This is my lambda. Right? And uh, in the quantum picture, again, say we're going more in the lecture, uh, lecture the wavelength and the momentum is related through the Planck constant h. Right, H is a Planck constant, 6.6 .6 10 to the minus 34 jar, uh, jar second. Okay. So now, when the waves waves effect is important, I'm going to give a very simple uh, argument example. In fact, I say you will say that a significant difference, even though we in my both most of my research is fall into classical size effect regime, but uh, I've been always thinking it's much better if you start with a wave picture to understand uh, how the wave we go from wave to the particle. Why? That's because when you go nano, there is always an interface. An uh, interface, ideal interface, is uh, zero thickness. Zero thickness is compared to anything is too thin, too small, right? So there, the wave effect always, one can start with thinking about the wave reflection at the interface. So uh, even though um, most of you probably don't deal with waves very often, I want to emphasize that we'll spend a lot of time to talk about the waves. Uh, so let me make a simple argument of standing wave. I have a film, or uh, in the first lecture, I say if you go to Professor Mongji Bawendi's website, you'll see he make beautiful dots, right? Nano size dots. And uh, uh, so I simplify that as a film. I make a two dimensional, very thin, freestanding film. I got an electron wave inside, right? I have charge inside. Or I have an atom. You can think of either way. So this is a wave inside, and there is a boundary, it cannot come out, right? So what do you have there? So confined, the boundary, simplest picture is uh, clamped, right? You see, OK, my wave, you, I thought it uh, depends. Uh, I wasn't sure how I'm coming to this stage. So I didn't bring the violin I have, OK? It's a standing wave. Right? So let's start with standing wave picture. And I have a finite thickness. OK, let me say my simplest picture is standing wave with at the boundary is zero vibration. I clamp these two boundaries. Right? So then my wave form, this is a, the standing wave, the simplest one, mode of standing wave. And the next mode, right? 
So I have those different modes of standing wave inside. And I can use the expression I gave and this requirement to give you basic quantization result. So how we do it? Lambda over 2, right? That's the basic length. And here is 2 times lambda over 2, uh, say, so it's just lambda. And uh, times n, this n is an uh, uh, integer, no longer the number density anymore, right? So lambda over 2 times n should equal to the thickness, g, or diameter, right? Order magnitude. So this is d. And this gives me lambda equals 2d over n, right? And that will give me momentum equal h over lambda. And that's a, a 2nd h. Wait, wait, wait. No, sorry. So 2nh over, no, nh over 2d. Right? That's momentum. OK, I, now I say I come to kinetic energy. This is, a, I'm jumping here. I say, OK, this wave also has a momentum and it has a kinetic energy. And uh, this is a quantized momentum because that n must be integer. n equals 1, 2, right? So now the energy En is, if I do the classical is mv square, and I write it into a momentum square 2m, because the momentum is mv. I put the momentum in, so I will get 8md square and n square times h square. So now suddenly the energy of this particle is discontinuous because of the wave requirement, right? So I need to ask, is this important? So that clearly depends on what's the m and what's the n, right? If the m and uh, say, what's the m and what's d? If m and d are large, the energy separation is very small. If they are small, this becomes very important. How important it is. So we need to have, again, order magnitude. Even though I always give you very, very small numbers, but I want you to be proficient in those numbers. You can choose whatever unit uh, you use. So let me first give order magnitude of KBT, right? We said everything is an equal partition and a one half KBT. So KBT is a good number to remember. How large is KBT? KBT is 1.38, 10 to the minus 23rd jar Kelvin and times 300 Kelvin. And this gives me Let me do that by heart. OK, it's uh, uh, 4.16, 10 to the minus 21 jar. You see, I don't remember this number. The, problem, the reason is, here I make a jump, most of the time, I like to remember in electron volts, OK? One electron volt is one electron actually under one volt, what's the energy? So one electron, what's the charge of electron? 19 coulomb times one volt. 
So this is 1.6, 10 to the minus 19 jar. And if you convert this KBT into jar, this is 26 milli electron volt. That's what I remember. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I used to be able to do brain calculations. 26 milli electron volts. That's the room temperature. OK, so why I do that? Let's go to look at the EN. Right? I'm going to put an electron into a film. Let's say the uh, film is uh, 100 Armstrong, 10 nanometer. OK, so one electron, uh, let's be consistent, electron. in 10 nanometer film. What's the mass of electron? Nine point one ten to the minus thirty one kilogram. Okay? So you plug in the number here is a 9.1 10 to the minus 31 kilogram. Here is a 10 minus, uh, because 100, 10 nanometer is 10 to the minus 8 meter square, right? H is a 6.6 .6, 10 to the minus 34 jar second. Okay? So you do that. I have a number here. I have then En for electron is uh, 0.6, uh, 0 0.6 10 to the minus 21 n square in terms of jar, or in terms of electron volt is 0 0.37 10 to the minus 2 n square electron volt. OK. So I said KBT is 26 milli electron volt. So if you look at the electron in this uh, 10 nanometer film, the separation between energy n equals 1 and n equals 2, that's a difference is a 3 times those number. That becomes comparable to KBT. Right? So this shows the quantum effect become important. And uh, but if it's a, a air molecule in this space, that m now goes twenty. So remember, the proton mass is two thousand times larger, right? So this energy separation becomes very small if it's an air molecule. So for air molecule, I don't need to worry about quantum size effect. But for electron, I need to start very, right? So this is a, uh, where when we go to nano, we could encounter both quantum and classical size effect. And also, as I said, uh, either the interface, if it's an ideal interface, the thickness is zero, the wave picture always becomes very, very important, right? And uh, Final comment, so we have quantum size effect, classical size effect. The final comment is the time, right? I shoot a laser, a very fast laser, microsecond laser. You say, can I use a Fourier law to describe the transport? And when is that become important, right? This is where this tau, the time becomes important. And you need to look at the, your transport process. How does that compare to this time? So mean free pass for air molecule, 100 nanometer. Velocity, 500, right? So that's about 10 to the minus 8 second. 
So if you do microsecond, don't worry about it. If you do picosecond or nanosecond, you start to worry about it. Right? So you have time scale, you have length scale, and this is where you need to be able to tell you are safe in one regime. You need to go, say, you have to think about the, what kind of size effect, or what, what kind of effects. Any questions? OK, if not, uh, remember, I would like to see you uh, in my office hour, and prefer preferably the first few weeks. <laughs>